All right, Aaron Torres, Fox Sports Radio, joins us now. Aaron, how you doing, brother? I'm doing good, Jake. Um, quick question. Am I breaking up a compelling hand-sized narrative conversation uh, that's tearing apart Baton Rouge right now or what? So we, we – look, oh, my gosh, we've talked hand size over the last couple of days. We, we made fun of it in the first block of the show. How ridiculous is that, Aaron? And you've been doing this for a very long time. The guy just threw 60 touchdowns, 6-0, against teams – that everybody said was better than LSU, Bama, Georgia, Florida, Clemson. I mean, you name it. The proof is in the tape. Who cares how big this guy's hand size is? A hundred percent. Yeah, no, it was so funny because I actually, uh, you know, I've been just running around the last two days. And so I just sat down to grab a bite to eat and flipped on the TV. And it was the lead topic on the show that I turned on. And, uh, you know, and I just got a chuckle out of it. And so it was appropriate that I was coming on with you guys. But, yeah, I just uh, tweeted something pretty similar. I'll take the dude. Uh, I'm much more concerned with the fact that he threw 60 touchdowns against, as you said, Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Florida, Auburn, Texas A&M, Oklahoma, Texas, than I am, uh, you know, whatever the measurement ended up being yesterday. The combine to me, I mean, there's so many different ways we could go about this, but I want to get don't your get him opinion. going on yeah, the combine. Don't get me going on the combine. But what's your opinion of the combine? What do you think the most important thing that these franchises can learn about a prospect is from the combine? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I know you probably went through it, Jacob. You probably have better insight than me. You know, I I think certainly on the basketball side, from people that I've talked to, I think what it's really about more than size, speed, weight, because you do have film, and Joe Burrow has two years as a starter, you know, various other points throughout his career at Ohio State. I just think for teams it's a great opportunity to get in front of a kid, get in front of a player, and see who he is, what he's about. Uh, You know, I know we get the ridiculous questions that come out of it, but I do think that part is an important element of this all, is that when you're using specifically a first-round pick – you're investing financially in that kid. Now, it's not as much as it used to be. The contracts have changed. But, you know, you want that person to be a contributor and a a face of your franchise going forward, especially if you're drafting a quarterback. And so I do think the value of getting in front of a kid uh, and a kid getting in front of a coach, a GM, an owner, or whatever, I think that part has value. I think the height, weight, size, speed, I think all of that is a little bit overrated unless the guy is just completely out of shape like Maurice Claret, you know, 10, 12 years ago, whatever it was. But other than that, I think it's more just being able to, to kind of meet face-to-face. Aaron Torres from Fox Sports joining us here on Hanging with Hester. Aaron, let's flip the basketball here. LSU headed to Florida tomorrow to face Mike White's Gators. It was a preseason top 10 team. It looks like it has a lot of pieces but hasn't quite put it together yet. What do you make of this Gator squad as we – peak towards March yeah I think it was either last week or the week before we spent a lot of time talking about them you know I'll give them credit they have looked good the last two two and a half weeks Uh, more like the team that we thought they were going to see with it that we thought we were going to see in the preseason they did uh they did not win at Rupp Arena they had won three straight before that Uh, I think tomorrow night is going to be a good reflection of who this team is because if you watch the Kentucky game really Kentucky made a second half run They were in control, had a couple of kind of stupid turnovers late, but really were about probably six to eight points better than Florida over the course of that game. And so my big thing with Florida, um, are these two weeks a reflection of the fact that they just hit a soft spot in their schedule where they played Texas A&M, where they played Vanderbilt, where they played uh, Old Miss, I forget, they played somebody else that's not very good. I think Georgia maybe. And is it a reflection of that, or is it a reflection of a team that's actually turning a corner? And to your point, Jacob, actually maybe starting to look like the team that we thought they might look like in the preseason. I've always been a big Mike White fan. I see this year with the losses starting to pile up, some frustration on Twitter. I realize you can take Twitter for what it's worth, but what's kind of your impression of Mike White from from 10,000 feet? Yeah, it's it's tough because I, I kind of see both sides where I, I do think he's probably been a little bit disappointing Um, The last two years, I think there's no doubt that they have not achieved relative to preseason expectations. Now, to their credit, they did turn things around late, uh, late last season in the regular season. But, but, you know, at the same time, like I said, I think overall you would consider both seasons somewhat of a disappointment, and this year certainly a disappointment to this point in the season. But listen, you know, Florida fans were also probably realistically a little bit spoiled by Billy Donovan. I mean, you know, now that we're removed from that, you know, four, five, six years, whatever it's been, 
That guy made four Final Fours, won two national championships, had plenty of other teams that were contenders, um, you know, and just couldn't break through. I think they they made a bunch of Elite Eights. I think they made like three Elite Eights in a row and didn't make a Final Four uh, earlier this decade. And so I only bring it up because, um, you know, I think fans were probably a little bit spoiled by that guy, and I think that we all just thought the foundation was built, the next guy is going to keep rolling. It hasn't been the case. But I also don't think it's unfair to say that, like I said, the last two seasons they've disappointed relative to expectations. They've disappointed relative to the talent on their roster. And at a certain point, you do have to hold the head coach accountable. And I understand a Florida fan that is a little bit frustrated with them right now. Aaron, a couple weeks ago, we were talking about Kentucky, Auburn, and LSU being right there at the top. One of those teams was going to take over. We were kind of guessing who it would be. Kentucky has been that team. They're 12-2 and in conference. They have a two-game lead over Auburn and LSU, Hagens, Richards, those guys have really stepped their game up. And we didn't really know because this is an older team for Kentucky. Now, it's not a veteran team by other people's standards, but for them, it is a very veteran team. Their players have stepped up, quickly stepped up. They've had guys kind of turn it up a level. And this Kentucky team, to me, looks a lot different than they did three weeks ago, now all the way up to number eight in the country. Yeah, I was talking to somebody, uh, just a a friend, but that works in basketball that I respect, and he thinks that having that veteran presence could be the difference in them getting back to a Final Four. They haven't been back since 2015, which doesn't feel like that long ago. But for Kentucky fans, you know, they they have the expectation of national championship uh, being at least in the conversation, playing on the final weekend every year. And his point was exactly what you just said, Jacob, is that this tournament is so much about the experience. Have you been there before? Are you going to be comfortable in those big moments? And ironically, you know, um, last season when Kentucky lost, it was with a bunch of these same guys that are that are playing for them now on the court. Obviously, a couple guys, P.J. Washington, Tyler Hero left. But the point that, that he was bringing up, and I think it's a good one, is now they're weirdly the veteran team. And it's it's kind of just a strange year in college basketball because the, the best teams, are, you know, are probably a little bit down relative to previous years. But, you know, Duke had a couple guys come back last year when traditionally they don't have anybody. Kansas, as we saw this weekend, Adoka Azabuke is a senior. Devon Dotson is a sophomore that was right on that NBA draft. Cuspin decided to come back last year. Um, Kentucky's the same way. And so those elite programs, they're always going to recruit the best talent just because history tells us that's going to be the case. But this year, those teams weirdly have a lot of guys back, which I think is only going to help them as we get closer to the NCAA tournament. The SEC had its bumps in November and December for sure. What do you think the committee thinks of the league uh, when they get to to the room in Selection Sunday? I think the committee thinks that they would hope that somebody besides Auburn, LSU, and Kentucky could consistently win some games, man. Um, it's funny. I, you know, A little preview of my, my podcast. I do have Jimmy Dykes on, on Thursday's show, and I, I recorded with him this morning, and you know, we kind of talked about this. Is It feels like half of the league is on the bubble. Um, Arkansas is on the bubble. Mississippi State's on the bubble. I think Florida's probably a little bit closer to the bubble than a lot of people realize. Um, South Carolina was there. And I bring up all these teams because it's not only that they're on the bubble, it's the fact that, like, like they're not winning the games that they're supposed to to get themselves off the bubble. And, and every program's a little bit different. Obviously, look, Arkansas had some injury issues, whatever. But Mississippi State in the last couple of weeks, you know, they were in prime position, and then they lose at Ole Miss. They lose to South Carolina – or, excuse me, to uh, Texas A&M. And all of a sudden, they're back on the wrong side of the bubble. Um, Tennessee is another one that had some chances. I don't really blame them because they've definitely been injury prone. But they had their chances, and they couldn't do it. Florida, as we just talked about a minute ago, has some bad losses. They lost at Ole Miss by 18 points. That's just not a game you're supposed to lose. And so I think the selection committee says, I don't care whether we're going to give you four, five, six bids. We just need to figure like like somebody needs to step up and grab, like I said, that fourth or fifth bid because I watch these teams and some nights you watch a Mississippi State or an Arkansas and you say, that for sure looks like a tournament team. And then two or three days later, they, they take a bad loss. So I think that's the big thing with the committee right now is can they get any consistency from these teams outside the top three? Aaron Torres of Fox Sports Radio is our guest here on Hanging with Hester. Aaron, some movement out west over the weekend, really some movement at the top of the 
polls when you have a Kansas team beating a Baylor, but out west you had San Diego State losing for the first time at home to UNLV. You had Gonzaga lose on the road against BYU in a game when BYU looked like they're a team that can make some noise in March as well. Did that change your opinion of Gonzaga or San Diego State or even Baylor for that matter? No, it actually didn't, Jacob, to be perfectly honest with you. You know, I mean, um, Baylor, look, you lose to a really good team. It's a three-point game. The crazy thing about Baylor was, first of all, their second-leading scorer had just come back from an injury, and they went 8 for 15 from the foul line. It's weird. This is going to sound crazy. In a lot of ways, that game made me feel better about Baylor, where Baylor goes to Kansas, pulls off the upset at the time, and you know Kansas is coming back, coming for blood. Now, obviously, you're at home. You want to win that game. But for all the variables to be working against them and to still be right there with a chance to basically uh, tie it and send it to overtime at the buzzer, like that weirdly made me feel good. Um, Gonzaga, very much the same. Listen, BYU, people don't realize they are, I believe, statistically the number one three-point shooting team in college basketball they're one of these programs where, you know, they may not have the history or whatever, but they play in an 18, 20,000 seat arena. That place was insane. It was as tough of a road environment on that particular night as any, anywhere you're going to see in college basketball. And so I'm not worried. You know, the San Diego State game, I was actually hosting radio. I didn't get to watch closely. So I don't know if there's some, you know, overarching, you know, issue that, that popped up that, that, um, should be concerning for people getting ready to fill out a bracket here in two or three weeks. What I would say is UNLV has been a tough team all year. Uh, first year head coach. He's, he's kind of like the buzz Williams of that conference. Like just has a bunch of guys playing really, really, really hard. They played San Diego state tough about two, three weeks ago. I tend to not worry about it. San Diego state is playing again tonight. So we should learn pretty quick uh, if they have a hangover or not. All right, he is Aaron Torres of Fox Sports Radio. I'm going to get one more in before we let you go. Your prediction, where where does LSU fall as far as seeding in the NCAA tournament? Oh, man. I got to look up up your schedule, and I got to – you're lucky I'm right in front of a computer here. Um, Where are they at? Like a 6-7 on all the – So I believe – I believe actually Fox Sports has them as a 6. ESPN has them as an 8. So it really seems like they're anywhere in that window. Yeah, listen, I, I, I just think I'm looking at the schedule now. I think if they take care of business, if they win a game or two in the SEC tournament, they feel like a 6-7 team to me. What I would do if I was LSU is I would try, I mean, try to win, obviously. But, you know, you obviously, in a perfect world, you want to uh, avoid the 8-9 line because the later you have to play a number one seed. Statistically, I, I know we say it's a down year. But statistically, you just have a much better chance of beating a number two seed versus a number one seed in that second round. So I would venture to guess if they take care of business, about a six, seven seed feels right. Obviously, if they pull off, you know, I don't know if it'll be an upset when they play Florida, but if they win that game, which could probably be considered a little bit of a coin toss if Florida's playing better, uh, you know, they win a couple games in the SEC tournament, that'll help. But about six, seven seed feels good to me. Aaron, I appreciate your time. You can follow along on Twitter with Aaron at Aaron underscore Torres. We'll catch up with you Monday. All right. Thank you both. Have a good afternoon.